and I'm Corinna Gantis, your host for Behind the Pen. We're on a special for the LitCon 2021 book convention. I hope you're all taking part or coming to see all these new books and going to the virtual author booths that belong to all these amazing authors. Today, my special guest for the LitCon 2021 is Tina O'Haley. O'Haley, yes, I think I've got that right. Welcome to the show, Tina. Thank you for having me. Now, O'Haley is an Irish name. So, it I is. roots from there? I'm from everywhere. Um, my husband is from Ireland, about two generations, um, though it's actually Haley. We added the O just to be um, rebels uh, many <laughs> years ago. Um, my family comes from England and, and um, Italy and just everywhere, just like if, if they were getting on a boat, that was me. And where are you yourself now? Where in the world are you now? We're in the mountains of Tennessee, up near oh, Montreal. Wow. I was saying, you haven't, snow today. you haven't got a, a very uh, American-ish accent at all to you. That's well, I try and hide the southern accent, but it comes out if we, we get, um, you know. Um, yeah, tip. I just heard it just say. <laughs> <laughs> very clever, very clever. Yeah, I've got Irish roots. My grandfather was from Dublin. My nan and pap were Irish. My mum was half Irish. My dad was oh, wow. Canadian. So uh, I'm a little bit of everything as well. And then I'm over in Greece now. So there you have it. Have you been I to Greece? I've never been there. No, no, no oh, I, I wow. live in Scotland, but never Greece. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful people, beautiful country. Couldn't wish for a better place to live. Love it. Okay, let's get down to the business. Uh, Behind the Pen is for authors, um, illustrators, musicians, editors, um, directors, producers, anyone who basically picks up a pen is on my show. And yourself, what is it you do, Tina? So by day, I am a professor of animation. So, so I animate both in 2D and 3D, sometimes stop motion. Uh, and then in the evenings or early, early mornings, I write uh, uh, fantasy and uh, thrillers actually now. Wow, where should we start? Um, <laughs> wow. Well, when you're an artist, I know that when you're an artist, it's normally you're not in just the one profession. When you're an artist, you, you have that gift that you're able to do other things. Like for myself, I'm an author, but I'm also a singer. Um, my, for you, you're an artist as well as a writer, an author. So let's go way, way back. And when did it all start for you? Was it, what came first? Was it the drawing or the writing? The piano. Oh, wow, well, there you go. She's a musician as well. Love it. Yes. <laughs> Um, I would say that started first. I, I uh, trained and actually competed in, in like high school and things like that and then and loved the piano. Um, so that was my first entrance into creativity. And what it happened was, is that there was this rule in the house and all my siblings would just be like, oh my gosh, the rule. When I was playing piano, no one could interrupt. It was like, my, and it was a busy house and I'm an introvert, right? So all this, you know, noise and cacophony and things going on. But when I was at the piano, it was like, everyone be quiet. Tina is playing. She's got to practice. That's like a rule. So that taught me to, that the creativity was a safe space. So then I branched into art and probably about the same time, I was probably, you know, real little, like eight or 11 or something. Um, I, I got the typewriter out, the, got this old beat up, you know, royal typewriter from my mother and started writing short stories. And so it just all kind of came together as when I created, the world disappeared. And that was wonderful. What a great thing to have as a kid. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, now it's all uh, mobiles and computers and laptops and what have you. But back then, creativity was the way to escape as a child. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember how old I was when I first started writing, but I definitely used my writing as a way to escape. I've never been much of an artist. I think for me, I've got to be in the mood to be, to draw something, but when I am, then I can really concentrate and I can do something good and something good will come out of it, whether it's a painting or a sketch. Same as poetry, I could never read a poem book 
but I could write poetry if I'm in the right mood. Mm -hmm. You feel that same way, yeah? I do, I do. I, I, it, it's challenging to read uh, poetry, I find, um, unless, like, unless, and they're like, you know what, I really get it now, and, and I'm, I'm all into it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you went to college or university to study, what was it, was it illustration or, or uh, writing or something totally different? It was animation, actually. It, it was, was one animation. of the very first degrees. And I actually start, I started out as a graphic designer. I was horrible, absolutely horrible. That was back in the days when you had to do it by hand and the computer was just getting invented. And then I found these computers like in this little room, like, hey, what's that? I know how to program. I took a class in high school and I was kind of a nerd on the side. And uh, so I found that and then changed my major and haven't looked back. It's just, it has been fabulous. But my grad degree is actually computer programming, hardcore. Uh, because I wanted a challenge and wanted to prove I could do it because I actually have no math background really. Um, so, so that, but that's helped me because I write textbooks on that side of things. So for animation, gotcha. I write textbooks um, that get a little nerdy. And then uh, of course, that's always my interest is a little bit of science and things that I don't know about, but they're fun to learn. And I pour those into my fantasy books. Wow. So you are really mixing them together, aren't you? I try to. So, so the first thing you got published then um, as a, when you could call yourself a published writer, a published author, what was the first thing you got published? So in 2010, I published my first textbook, um, but I didn't consider myself a writer, even though like it was the first book in its, of its kind, it's still the only book of its kind in its topic. Um, but I was like, no, nah, that's just, you know, that's just textbooks. So no. I self-published a novel in 2016. Um, I finished the book. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to learn as this self-publishing thing. Uh, so so proud and sold, you know, maybe a hundred copies to mostly my cousins who, who just, uh, I love them. They, they're just my, my best fans. They're precious. And uh, they made a big deal. And some caver friends, uh, I'll get into that. It was for, it's about caving. I'm a caver on the side. And oh <laughs> right, I just don't, I don't sit still, <laughs> right? I know, but no, I do. I get my, my eight uh, every every night. I have to um, oh nowadays, but but then a publisher picked it up, and in 2018, it was actually published um, by a small indie publisher from Texas, and I've been through that ride and and published another book since with them. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's uh, it, it's been wonderful. Now I feel like. I've joined in with a couple of writing groups to help, you know, learn the craft and, and you know, really get into why you would use the semicolon, not use a semicolon. Um, and this is super helpful. And, and I have to do a shout out because the original book, the very first one was because of the um, writers group I was in, S-H-I-D-D-Y writers group. There you go. Um, so that, and our goal was you had to write a book, you had to finish it. It didn't matter how awful it was. And I think that was the hardest thing because I was so set up as a professor of animation and, you know, I write all these textbooks and, you know, I'm so perfect. Uh, so, you know, how, what happens if I write something and it's awful? What if it's a dumpster fire? And so having that group to help me get through and just say, yes, we have to write it. Doesn't matter. Put another name on it if it's bad. And it was actually pretty good. I mean, that sounds a lot like um, November novel writing. Have you ever joined that? Have I you did. ever done it? Did you? I've, I've finished two. You did finish two. Well done. Mm -hmm. I've done it once, but only because I'd already had the the plot and, and the scene sort of mapped out. So it's basically just going in and writing it. And uh, I completed it, but I won't do it again because... It's Congratulations. It's, it is hard. And... I just feel like you rushing it when you shouldn't rush a novel. Um, it's not for everyone. I think when you, these people that give themselves so many words to do every day, I'm like, why? Why you do that to yourself? Because you've really got to be in the zone to write. Otherwise, what you're writing isn't half as good as what it would be if you were in the zone. Mm -hmm. Does that well, make sense? It does make sense. It totally makes sense. So, so the first one, I, I, the first, I tried one and I totally failed. And, but I was cheering all my other friends on because I just finished Absolute Darkness, my first book. 
And I didn't quite do, I started my second one, like now it just, it was just awful. Uh, then whatever year, 2000, I can't even remember, 18, I think. I, I did Novel November and I had done the outline. So I started my research in August. I did the outline in September and I was fully immersed and ready to, to burst through with, with these characters. Um, so Novel November was, I actually enjoyed it that way. So I, I wrote, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do like the thing, When Darkness Begins, um, this one, my wonderful little YA thing, and this was the origin novel of my character from Absolute Darkness. And it, it got puked out in Novel November. And then I just obliterated it through the next year and rewrote it and uh, worked with uh, my uh, 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 friends and critique groups and beta readers on it, alpha readers on it um, to, to make it something. Because what comes out in Novel November is just not, not useful, like you said. Exactly, unless it's already written and then you're using the month to actually tidy it up and then you say, oh, look, I did a novel and you cheat. But uh, like some yeah. people do, I know that. So um, so you are a novelist of what young adult fantasy? Well, the first one, Absolute Darkness, um, is it's paranormal romance. With That's what we've shifters. Been yeah, werewolves, time, it, it's were vampires, what are we talking? It's kind of a vampire, and I do apologize for that. I'm so sorry, but I had to get out of my system. Oh, but he's so unique. No, you got to read it because it's, it's basically, it's a time traveling fellow who has to protect time in the universe. And of course, he's pitted against uh, the person who is trying to destroy time. Um, and he can see through all the time, he can manipulate it. The destroyer or the manipulator uh, cannot. He has to inhabit linears and that's us because we just see time linearly we're just trapped little mortals um so there's this epic battle going on and these two caver chicks other cave divers they're they're really um what way I, that I keep one, from <laughs> um so i don't cave dive right cave diving scares me i've almost drowned a couple times in my childhood i don't like water um so i wrote this book to scare me because i just don't like cave diving and these women love it and so it's all about them and they, they do go to a dry cave and they crawl into this world where this, this, this entity, Alexander, holds court. This is where he lives um, and, and he falls in love with the character. And I didn't mean that for that to happen. It happened on page four. I'm like, what? Why? That's not what I outlined. What do you do? No. Yes, I know. When they tell you to do something, you listen to them, you have to listen to where they take you because they're taking you on the right path and yes you listen to those voices yes definitely carry on it was it was it was a it was a great romp so it, it's it's like this time travel battle um uh, because uh, the 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 manipulator realizes alexander's fallen in love with this woman and he's like yeah okay gotcha you know we got we're around here, we've been around for like 10,000 years. What's a little trifle with that thing? You're playing with your food, let's go. And it's an all in all battle. I mean, he's just trying to kill her. And it's, I think it's wonderful. And it's, you know, there's time involved and, and it all comes together in this really satisfying ending. Um, so it's, it's fantasy. Um, it's, he's kind of a vampire, but it's not like I put it with the capital V. It's not, you, you, you might guess that he is. But Paranormal, not really like that. romantic time travel. Yeah, yeah. Paranormal Thriller. time travel romance. And you know, they always say that write about what you know, and you've got your science in there, you've got your caves in there, you've got your writing in there. So, I mean, who inspired you when you were younger um, to write? Who are your favorite authors? My mother read a lot and I grew up in the sticks, like totally nowhere at the end of a dirt road. I you know, didn't know what a library was, honest to heavens. Um, but my mother had this old rickety bookshelf. It leaned, it was made out of, you know, like aluminum or something and the screw was missing. And she loved romances and I don't do romances. I still don't like, so my paranormal romance is like with the lowercase D, no, no big D there. Yeah. Um, but she had all these books and I would steal them and try and read them. Yeah. Um, so I read Irma Bombeck probably way earlier than any child or person should. And she's very, you know, wonderful and charming and talks about things I didn't know about. And then Stephen King, of course, was next. And then Kuntz, because my mother liked horror. 
Coombs. Oh, I right. love him. His I love dialogue. him. He's, and he's, what I love about his books, and I, I don't like him, but what I love about Coombs' books is they are so realistic that he writes about what could be happening or could happen, and that's what's chilling about them because he doesn't just do a horror, oh, this is a fantasy horror, it will never happen, Pet cemetery coming alive, blah, blah, blah. What he writes about, that's what's scary because you know that it could be happening or could happen. But yeah, I love Coots. But um, King, I found, was too creative his writing. I couldn't get into his books. I'd be going through pages trying to get to the dialogue and to the action and getting rid of all of his creative writing. I just could not read his books. But um, my mum was a, a huge, huge romance fan, Mills and Booms and Harlequin. And I think one of the first books I picked up of hers as a young child, which I shouldn't have been reading, was Victoria Holt. And we're going into <laughs> historical romance. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got that same background there as well. It's amazing how much mm -hmm. we have in common. Um, That's fun. So you finished off your first book as a standalone. Or did you know it was going to have a second book? I didn't know it was going to have a second book. Um, as I was finishing it up, no, as I went, when I went to the novel November, I was trying to figure out where did Alexander come from? It was just questions I wanted to answer. Mm -hmm. um, because here I had this character, he'd been, he's, you know, been around for 10,000 years, but he seems older than that. And I wanted to know where his nemesis came from. And so I, I just started figuring out, well, where is he from? And where is people? Who are these people? And so I ask of those, ask those questions and this character as just, just like for this character with the shaman, the shama, she, she just walks into the room, you know, with these nasty, gnarly, bloody teeth anklets around her, her ankles and demanded attention. I'm like, okay, well, who are you? And please tell me. And what ended up being was that this is an 80,000 year old species. They actually, we are their throw offs, their genetic throw offs. Um, that can live in the day. Um, they become at time travelers um, and actually it's a multiverse that they live in and actually she lives in the multiverse. So she just wields and is part of the dust of the cosmos. Um, and as the cosmos uh, forms, she kind of wishes herself into being and pulls in and uh, what she wants. And this time she pulled in the Vecchi tribe and they come from all around the world and the other thing is, is that as she's pulling it and in this uh, When Darkness Began, I'm pulling from archaeological facts and digs and skeletons that have been found in, in different places. No one knows, nobody cares, but I do. It was really cool. Like, I love it. <laughs> like, oh, look, there's a little, little person. She came from this little cave over here in China and they come, came from the little people over in Australia and they came through and they all hopped on boats. Uh, I love that stuff. So there's some fact in it. And, uh, and then they all come together and she forms this tribe. And then she uses the one thing that I manufactured, which is a huge cosmic event, I won't give it away, that pushes them all through time in the world um, so that they can then land and then they protect from, from what is the manipulators. And then you find out the heart wrenching uh, source of the manipulators and who they really are. Um, and, then, and then you find out how Al Alexander fell in love, his first love, um, it's a very sweet, it's, it's a romance, but not really, it's just a sweet, like, first love uh, type of romance. Why a lot of sci-fi in it, I think, I would say. Yeah. More than the so first So he falls book. in love with, mm -hmm. he falls in love with um, his, uh, his pal who he grew up with, but she's not developing the time-seeing traits. So she's going to be either killed in the event, or she has to go off and live like a linear and that's his first love. So this is why how he developed 10,000 years later to love the Linears is because he's just trying to save her over and over again mm -hmm. and trying to atone for the mistakes he made. And it's, it's really, I think it's, it's well um, crafted. It, it all ties together and it has this multi-layered uh, thing that goes on that I love. Um, and, and some people will see it all, they'll just see the story and some other people will see like everything that's tying them together. Is it a duology or is it going to be a trilogy, duology and finished. Um, I, 
I don't have the trilogy there. I don't have the third yet, but what it is is a universe. So it's the darkness universe. So I've got absolute darkness. And I've got when darkness begins. I had to look at the title to see what the title was. Just and that was funny. I just saw you that. Um, I just saw so, that. So, I did, like, mi- it is I did miss that. <laughs> oh, I, I have to keep my name tag on me. Uh, but that's like the darkness universe. And then the dark book I'm writing now, which is called A Dark Drink. It's a thriller straight up. Um, no time travel, no nothing. They're not aware of each other. And it's just it's just this woman. Jude, she just wants to ride motorcycles, go caving, and make drinks. She does mixology YouTube video drinks. And everything comes crashing down when she gets a severed finger in the mail and her world falls apart. And it just gets, you know, it crazier from there. But she's not aware of Alexander in the Darkness universe. But Alexander and Brandy from those books actually walk through this book and they're there because it's part of the cavers side of so things. But you- they don't know it. So it is a trilogy. You are, even though you're not classing it as, but it is it going carrying on, even though you're not taking the the main chunk, the main plot, and bringing it over to another one. You started a whole new plot, but you've got a couple of the characters coming in to to say hi, and then sort of run back out again, and not getting mm-hmm. in, too involved into the the new plot of your new book. So. This, this trilogy, um, is this the one that's with the, the publisher? Yes, the first two are with the publisher, um, uh, Black Rose Writing. Mm-hmm. The third I've heard one of I them, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're a self-published author as well with your tech books. Uh, well, the textbooks actually are through Focal Press. Oh, so right, it, Okay. And they've got, they, they've been bought like five times, uh, you know, in the larger publishing houses, they just buy each other up and it would be like the book place pretty soon. All right, gotcha. So um, what are the books have you published or are you getting ready to publish now? Um, yeah, the current one is, I mean, the final rewrite is A Dark Drink. And You're in that one- Draft three. Draft two or yes. draft three? Draft three. Dra- in draft three now. Right. So, so that one I should fin up, finish up this year and been, be seeking a publisher for it. Watching Pit Mad on Twitter and it, it sent friends to it and watched them. I'm like, you know, that seems like a cool thing I want to try um, to get an agent that way. Have you, are, do you have any experience with the, the Pit Mad? I don't know. I'm very curious about it. I watch it every time it goes about every quarter. Um, you, you, you do a crafted tweet. Um, with certain categories so the agents can that are uh, looking for uh, uh, works search through it by category so you have to have a strong category to work in it so so finally I have a thriller um, and then they ask for the query and you just don't blow it on the query and and uh, see where so it goes it's just from, from a tweet just from a tweet mm-hmm. using a certain hashtag that the agents are looking for to see all these uh, queries okay let me just get a pen how do you spell that? Um, it's P I T Pit Mad. Mad M A D. Mhm. And and, I, and I don't know like all the details behind it. But that's um, the but hashtag. An, yes, that's the hashtag. And Brilliant. if you if you that, they've got a website with all their information. Yeah, I'll go and check that out. That sounds. You said it then you do it every four four times, four times mm-hmm. a year. Yeah, so I had a friend, and the way it works is at, you do the tweet, and the only people that should like the tweet are those that are interested in it, um, you know, hopefully. And so agents, publishing houses, uh, click a like or, or hit a message, a reply, and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm accepting queries. You know, wow. Please submit. So oh, kind of get to the top of the stack. Yeah, I wonder when the next one comes out. I'm just it, about. They just had one. Ah. I think it was last weekend. Oh, no, I missed it. I'm just about finishing off um, my latest novel. It's uh, it's probably one of the most violent and sexual and what have you novels that I've done yet. It's a um, dark romance mafia thriller. And we have wow. the three mafias, the Greek, the Russian and the Italians. And I've used native dialogue in all of their dialogues and then um, translated it into English underneath. So you've actually got traditional Russian dialogue 
so people can learn the language while they're reading. <laughs> no, it's Absolutely. actually a marketing. Do you speak Russian? No, it's actually a marketing ploy. You see, it gets me into the Russian, the Italian, and the Greek markets. You see, by using foreign okay. dialogue. We'll see what happens. It's something different, but uh, um, a publisher's a region at the moment. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed there. Um, but um, I've had so much fun reading it. But my editor got triggered by it. But she said, but that's good. It means that you did really well with your writing if you can affect me like that. You know, and then the beta readers were like, yes, it was but you, you did it in a way that it wasn't too much. You know, yes, you did get explicit, but it wasn't so bad that I couldn't read it sort of thing. But uh, yeah, mm. I'm really excited about that. Broken Chains, look out for that one. It's coming out soon. That's so excellent. yeah, well, we've got to keep going, don't you? <laughs> well, this is what I do. And I think you're doing the same here that uh, it, you're not sticking to one genre. You're trying out these different genres that will give you different marketplaces and find you new readers, even though your third book is still taking some of the characters and maybe you could still call it paranormal, but it's in the thriller genre, which is a new genre for you. So you'll find your new marketplace, you're going to find your new readers and hopefully they'll go back and want to read book one and two after. So that, that's the whole thing of what we're doing. We're trying to, I mean, there's so many authors that do write in one genre and God bless them, you know, um, but I couldn't do that. I thought I was because I did a four book series when I first started 27 plus years ago. Um, and uh, it was for outlaw motorcycle clubs, a bit like Sons of Anarchy. Before Sons of Anarchy ever came out, my books are out there. Just, just so everyone know, I was out there first. And um, it was a four book series. And I thought, oh, you know, is that it? Am I gonna carry on? Because my passion was biking. My passion was um, singing in a rock band. You know, I was into that lifestyle. So like I say, you write about what you know on your first books and that's what you've done. That's what I did. But then I went straight from that into YA fantasy. That's like doing a total, uh, you know, six, 360. Um, and then I've done young adult and I've done erotica. I've done dystopian. I've done science fiction. Uh, you know, if the, the, when it, when the book and the idea hits you and it grabs you and it won't let go, then you know that you've got to write that book. You know, when they start talking to you and can't sleep because of the scenes and you've got to get that scene out of your head. That's when you know that that book has got to be written. And that's over. That's what's happened with me. I've never been forced to write something. I've never forced myself to write something. Um, my readers wanted a, a, a sequel to the In Times of Violence, which is my first ever book. It was like um, The Outsiders of 2019 or whatever. And um, I had no plans at all of doing a sequel. I, that was it. That was my one book. I just wanted it published. I was happy. They wanted a sequel, did the sequel. Then the next book came and then, and then it just carried on from there. But I, and since then, I've done another seven, eight books. So it just, you know, <laughs> it just goes to show. But if you're like me, you have all these ideas and you start writing, but then another idea comes and you start writing that and one of them grabs you and then that's the one that you work on. But then you've got all these underneath your bed or, or under the mattress or in the bottom of your drawer or in your office or whatever, all these notepads yeah. of ideas. <laughs> Where's mine? Where's mine? <laughs> all these notepads of ideas. So after you've finished this book and we will okay we're talking maybe not published till next year but you'll be working on something new while it's with the editor and the beta readers alpha readers whatever so what ideas come next for you what, what's next for tina you know that's interesting because you usually by now another character has appeared and and i have to tell them please wait your turn you know just sit down and hold on you're you're, you're you'll come up with the cue soon 
Um, and a couple have sparked just because of like a news story or something like that. I'm like, oh, that would be really cool. But I haven't completely jumped yet. Um, it'll come, it'll come. It, and, and it'll, it'll always involve caves because that always, is huh? a, a p passion I have um, ever since I found the first one um, maybe 15 years ago. And I just adore it because it's scary and frightening and it's also hilariously fun. It's like it's a big uh, kid's underground uh, jungle gym. Um, so there'll always be that. Uh, so um, we'll see. And, and it, I, like two months ago, I was actually in a cave and I was talking to a friend in front of me. And usually you're like crawling along and you don't see the best view of your friend because you're, you know, you keep your head down. And we were talking, I said, you know, maybe the next one should be a romance because I have such a difficult time with the topic, reading it or, or writing it. Like maybe I should just go for a bodice ripper and just see see what that's like. Um, I don't know. That that's that's you're talking the, about erotica here. Yes. Yeah, like, go for oh, it. No, yeah. no. I tell you what, I've never, don't I've never use read a pen one. name. Don't don't be embarrassed and use a pen name. No. You know, because everyone was saying to me, your your readers, yeah, they they love your your mixed stuff. You yeah, they love your thrillers, they've loved your your um, young adult uh, fantasy, you've loved your short stories. Now you're going to give them a dystopian erotica, really? You see how many subscribers you lose. And I was worried, you know, and I, I warned people that it was coming up and I was ready and I had the release and I put it on my newsletter and I lost six subscribers. And, you know, <laughs> they were ready for it. They loved it, you know. It's... it's uh, Erotica, if you don't have the book, the erotica part taken over the book and just have the erotica in the book, then it works. But for those people that make the book an erotica, it doesn't work. Do you see what I mean? So you've, you, you, you've got your plot, you've got your, your genre you're writing in, but you're being explicit when it comes to the sexual scenes. That's it. I'll that say go sense. go for it because it's good fun and, and lots of research. <laughs> oh my. Well, character driven and, and building a world that they're in, that I can do. The rest I'll have to figure out and it'll be good research. <laughs> I mean, the, the world that you've built with your, your first two, two three books, um, world building is uh, one of the things we're doing with LitCon. <clears throat> We have a lot of panels, live panels, where we're going to be talking with, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to be talking with authors about the world building they've done in sci-fi or fantasy, uh, paranormal and what have you. I think I'm signed up for one of those. Are you? Oh, good. Yeah. Good. That's, that's going to be good fun. I, I'm hosting about six of them, so it could be, you could even be in one of mine, who knows. Um, but yeah, LitCon's going to be good fun for those people are watching now it's past it's finished so you missed it so wait till next year <laughs> but have you ever thought with your illustration your good sense of humor you certainly have one and your love for k's or your love for science to actually do a children's book um i have one right back there uh, but I, I wrote it for my kids and illustrated it. And, I, and that, that's where it is. It sits back there. Now I read it. I'm like, oh, there's some typos in there. I got to fix that. Um, uh, it's, it's always there. Uh, I've, actually, I have a couple of them uh, that I've written. One my husband illustrated. He's also an artist. We met in art school. Oh, and, that's uh, so sweet. I've never gone through and thought about putting them out there. Uh, but now that it, it's so accessible, right? The, the, the self-published route is, is more than it's ever been. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm children's books people. i mean children's books the the authors mm -hmm. these illustrators they're just as big as the fantasy authors now i mean they're so wanted and 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 so um well um received and and, and sell really really well that that's something mm -hmm. you could think about doing in between your next book you know because it doesn't take long to write a children's book and with you being a an illustrator anyway or an aminator um, you can do, uh, I could see an animation, the whole film of your children's book. Have you ever thought of doing that? You know, I know animating is so difficult and it takes forever, 
but have you got book trailers of your first two books? Have you made your own? Mostly, yeah, mostly um, I did for Absolute Darkness, I did a lot of uh, just animated GIFs. Um, uh, nothing huge or anything, but yeah, just, just small animated uh, images out there. That's that, was, that, that was fun. Yeah, I mean, you've got to think, everything's virtual now, everything's virtual marketing, virtual promotion because of not being able to go out there and do your book readings and your book signings and book conventions. So thinking out of the box is how you're going to get noticed. And I think um, animation video of a trailer of your book would be really unique. I know it's going to be a lot of hard work and many, many hours, but I just think it would be really unique. And if you you had the audacity and the time to do it, then, you know, that's that's uh, something that would be really really unusual and uh, I, I would love to see that myself but uh, I still want to see your gif so you've got to show me your gifs I'll show them to you and, and it's um and, and you are right right so so a lot of authors walk at it like I you know they don't know how to you know they're not very digital savvy and and all these things that you have to do and of course I'm digital native and and take it for granted that I can be like, you know what, I think I'll just make, you know, all these, these gifts out here. And so I had a huge promotional campaign for Absolute Darkness um, on, on multiple levels. There was, yeah, and, and I, I just had a blast. And then I turned around and actually use those. And I teach in with some of my classes how to make them. Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm laying around and, I, and I'm teaching intro to computers sometimes. Like here, this is how I did this. That's and, really cool. Uh, it, it was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, you've got so many talents and, and not just um, talent, but your hobby as well with the caving and you're saying you're still getting eight hours sleep at night. How do you do it? How are you multitasking? How are you, <laughs> you've you got a calendar where you pick off times to do certain things every day. It. it is, it really? Time management. Yeah, time, time management. management. So it, it's a routine, like right now I'm in the quarter. So I'm teaching, um, uh, you know, I teach four classes on on a, a light quarter, five classes when I'm overloaded. Um, and, and the university I work at, like, it's it's all in. Like, I don't really have much time to have other thoughts because I have to really, like, it, it's hardcore. Um, it's like top tier teaching. Uh, so during the summers, during the December's off is when I do the bulk of my writing. And then when I'm teaching real hardcore, then I can do editing. I can do a little bit here and there. So, yes, yeah, super, super focused, lot, you know, time here, time there. But also, so, a very important, time to relax, right? What's so that? time to enjoy. What, what's no, that? Because <laughs> because as well as as well as your teaching, as well as your writing, you have to find time to promote your own books. But then I'm up at ten o'clock at night till ten at ten in the morning till ten at night for my clients five days a week. And wow. after 10 o'clock, I'm reading, but I'm also there in case they want to mess with me about anything. And then Saturday and Sundays is mine. That's when I market my books. That's when I do my writing, do my editing, whatever I, needs to be done. Or I couldn't get done in the week for my clients also goes into my weekends as well. Right. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh it's it's constant right I'm reading so uh, in my writer's group my writer's group is on Sunday um I just finished all my critiques for that group and now I've got two books in that I'm reading for for author friends uh one for feedback and one for uh, beta reading uh, for like a back a blurb right and it's a constant thing it, it, but I I do enjoy I love reading other people's books and then I'll take a break and I'll go read, you know, Cormac McCarthy or Cheshire Quinn Yarbrough, <laughs> like my favorite, favorite, favorites. Um, if it's, it's weird, but I'll read Blood Meridian once, once a year. And if I haven't, then I feel like I'm lost. I could go back and read it because he Aww. just makes me weep. It's just <laughs> like, actually reading those books made me want to write, um, made me want to publish because oh, he, wow. the best books have already been written it's okay. I can just, I can write. It, it, they, they've taken care of being the best. It's okay if I'm not best. Um, it, just fabulous stuff. Um, I'm gonna, can I put a, a gift there in the chat for you or? Of course you can, yeah. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I, uh, it was Essie Hinton that uh, made me want to become an author after reading all of her uh, 
The Outsiders, Rumblefish, that was then, this is now, Tex, Taming of the Star Runner, all of her little novellas. And after I went to the library, try and find more rebel type fiction, I couldn't find any. And I was like, that's my marketplace. If she can do it, I can do it because I've got a story to tell. And after 30 odd rejections from agents and publishers, I said, no, I'll do it myself then. And at the time there was no Kindle, there was no eBooks, it was all paperback. So uh, it, wow. was, it, was, it was harder, harder to sell most definitely, but um, you weren't selling your book for 99 cents. So you, anything you sold, you actually making money from. So that was mm -hmm. a good part of it. Well, yeah, the, I love the candles. I mean, of course, candle make it, you have these voracious readers that can just get, you know, belly up to the buffet of, you know, bites and, and it, it ingest as much as they want, uh, which is fabulous. Like, I, I love that. Um, I also, my, my books are available on Audible, and that was an experience. Oh, awesome. Mine's and, just coming uh, out. Oh, it's the coolest thing. And of course, <laughs> I used to, before the pandemic, I drive a lot, so I've listened to a lot of audiobooks super opinionated about you know voice acting and things like that it's hard i can't do it um and the the fellow that did absolute darkness his voice like you could just listen to him for days he got it he was he was definitely if i could pick somebody he would be he would be alexander's voice i loved it so um, is he doing number two for you uh, no, someone else did did the When Darkness Begins, and that's okay because it's YA and it's a, it's a, from a different uh, viewpoint, Thanks. and uh, and I enjoy that one as well. Uh, but it was quite it, it was painless. The publisher took care of it, and actually, kind of it was like Christmas presents. I didn't know what's happening until huh. they said, "Hey, by the way, surprise! Here you go." I'm like, "Oh, that's so cool!" Oh, I wow! Just, it's it's such a great experience. Yeah, my, mine's, I don't know when it's coming out, but mine's just been finished and I can tell you I bawled. When I heard the, the five minute promo um, of the reading that they're going to be using for, for sales and that, I'd bawled my eyes out because I'd been waiting for this. This uh, book, Illusional Reality, was written 2016 and as I live over in Greece, I can't or do my own audio books because I'm a narrator myself. I can't do my own audio books and I couldn't hire anyone. ACX wouldn't allow me to. So there's me with this beautiful book that I would love to have got an audio and it was never going to happen. And then when a publisher decided to take on both the two books, it's a duology. And uh, I said, oh, if are you going to do an audio book? I said, I'll sign with you if you're going to do my audio book. He says, yeah, I'll do your audio book. I said, I'm signed then. And that's one of the reasons why I signed with them because I've been self-published um, 14 books now and I'm self-published apart from two of them. So um, the only reason I signed with them was for that audio book and it's uh, going to be released soon. And it was, oh, it was amazing. First time I heard it, heard my words coming out by this uh, female female narrator and I was just bawling. <laughs> it's it's surreal. Like I mean there's the surreal thing when you unbox the you know the box of books and you smell the print, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, or when you, you get hold it, it, it you hold your table. baby for the first time in your hands and you're like, that's my book. It's surreal. It really is. I don't yeah. think it's so addictive, right? Isn't it the most addictive thing? I I, I it, you work so hard for it and it's in in you know or you see somebody else enjoying it and for me i'm like wow that's really cool i'm 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 just so touched by it and especially you know if you see them enjoying it like oh that's very cool i like that i had uh because there was no like social media i mean facebook didn't hardly exist at the time when my books came out and um we live in a tourist area and uh, at the time my husband was working in a, a karaoke bar and because I sing I used to go in and sing every night to get people into the bar you know so I used to be able to sing and have a good voice and um, then I'd go around to them with my books I was like do you want to sign a copy of my book you know and I worked for a, a doctor's surgery and they made me go around to this swimming pool once to look for a patient that was 
not paying their bill or something. And I swear to God, it was, I walked in and I saw four people holding my book in their hands around the swimming pool. That was the most surreal feeling. I was like, uh, that just made my day. And I've, it's like, I've, it, like it happened yesterday. I'll never forget that. Just walking around the corner and seeing my book in their hands. And, and then there's oh, wow. this one person came to the bar one night and she said, um, uh, my, has, my, my boyfriend's not very happy with you. And I said, why? She said, because I got so engrossed with your book that he nearly drowned in the pool. She was, <laughs> he got cramp and she was like this. Oh, that's the best review I could get. That, that's a, that, almost lost my boyfriend. Don't oh, read this. <laughs> unless you read it's a killer book. book, yeah. It's a killer book. But yeah, awesome. yeah, it's beautiful when you get feedback like that. It, it's, um, it is addictive um, and it gives you an incentive to keep going. It gives you the confidence to know that you've done something right and that people love your work. I mean, not everyone's going to love it. Um, I got a two star for my flash of horror the other day um, when everything was five stars up until then. And I'm like, yeah, OK, it happens. Not everyone's going to like it. And uh, years before, I would have been bowling over that two star review. I would have given up writing over that two star review. I would have ripped up all my books over that two star review. But you learn to be get uh, thick skin, but you also learn that not to give too much into the reviews. There is a lot out there as it is now, most most definitely. So, oh my gosh, I'd be embarrassed if somebody read any any of the things I read when I, I wrote when I was thirteen. Um, they're in the filing cabinet there. <laughs> you still got them. <laughs> I throw everything away except for that. It's very hilarious. I have every all the writing. So Please. Tina, how do you find your readers? How do you find your new? Um, I do a lot. I, I do find a lot when I do when I launch a book. I do a blog tour, and I tend to get a lot there through word of mouth. Um, and who then do you do blog, a lot of, sorry, who do you do blog tours with? Because I'm looking. Oh, a, a fabulous woman, um, Rachel, with Rachel Resources. I'll, I'll, I'll find the link and send it to you. I didn't even know what a blog tour was. And she held my hand and explained it to me very patiently. Um, and anyone that's going to take the time to explain something to me, I, I, I'm devoted because <laughs> they, 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 just, they, they were so wonderful to help me. Um, she's great. Rachel's Resources. Um, so I get it through there, a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact um, for my caving uh, side of things, the, the NSS, the National Speleological Society, they do a publication. They did a really nice write-up and review of, of my very first book, um, mm -hmm. uh, Wind Dar uh, Absolute Darkness, which is really sweet. Um, uh, the, the review said, um, don't get a six pack of beer and take that money and get this book, money well worth spent. And that's amazing uh... <laughs> for writing the community. Um, and I would love to do a more uh, book signings, right? You know, right now it's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, just a uh, little. You know, one one by one, things like this, and getting out and finding people, I think, is uh, is the way to do it. It is. It is um, straight um, one on one talking with a a, p a potential uh, reader. Um, they're talking with a real author, and they feel really happy about that. And uh, yes, you've got your book there and you'll sign it for them and maybe have some free swag as well. Why not to buy a copy? Um, with the virtual world, the way we're doing it now is virtual release parties, um, letting people ask questions while the authors are live on Facebook or wherever. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's one-on-one -on -one and it's, it's, it's that rapport that you have with that reader is whether or not you're going to get that sale or not. And I, I think specifically with, with the glut of information, everything that we have going on, right? Just for someone like, like I mentioned before, is there someone to take the time to, to look at you and, and, and say something? Um, I, I think that's what we crave. Even me, you know, the hermited introvert, I live on a mountain and I love it. 
um, but still we, we crave that contact. Uh, yeah. I, I reached out to one of my favorite authors and I can't pronounce his name, otherwise I'd, I'd pitch him. Uh, he did Children of Time um, and other science fiction, like, oh my gosh, he's great. And I just sent him like a little email, like, hey, love your books. And he answered me. And this is a dude that publishes a lot. I was like, I was really touched. And like, I'm, I'm, I now pay so much attention to him. And then Hugh Howie, who did the Wool and Steel trilogy, I went to a talk um, with him that he was giving and actually got put in like a Zoom breakout session with him and got to speak with him with some other oh, authors. Wow. Cloud nine, right? That just yeah. made my day because this man defined self-publishing and, and he's a fabulous writer. He, just, he does great science fiction and very um, appropriate for right now, uh, dystopian type of things. Uh, then just, you put yourself into the same shoes as the the reader, how they feel about you when they're talking to you. So you know how ecstatic they are to meet you, whether they're a fan, whether you're a new author. It's, oh, you're an author, you've published a book. Well, that's enough for them just to know that, you know? Yeah, I, think, I think people are very appreciative of what people do, I, I find anyway, wh whether it's it's their art or their animation or, you know, the fact that they're, you know, really digging, you know, baseball stats or something like that. Um, it, it just, you, you just got to connect with people. That's it. We want connection. This is the, the reason um, behind the pen works so well is because readers don't understand our process and our mindset. Uh, they are now because I've been doing this for since 2016. I think people understand how wacky and psychotic most of my readers, uh, most of my authors are. Um, <laughs> I take that uh, as a compliment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hear voices in our heads, you know, and they're like, "What?" <laughs> we talk to them. We talk and we have conversations with those we voices. We do. We mm -hmm. do. We do. We <laughs> do. It's, it's the norm for us, you know. But um, it's. It's important for me for them to understand the process and what goes into writing the book. They buy a 99 cents book off, off Amazon and they read it and they give it a two star <coughs> review because uh, they weren't didn't think it was worth five stars. But do you know how much went into that book? Do you know how much time, labor, blood, sweat and tears and nightmares and dreams and and time and and then it's not just the writing and for us the, the writing part's the easiest it's after the writing you've got the editing then you've got the formatting and you've got it, the covers and then you've got of course mm -hmm. the promotion and marketing especially <coughs> if you are a uh, self-published author it's up to us to sell our own books and mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of time and that is very that can be really depressing and disheartening for an author when they go on to KDP and they have a look for their spikes of sales and they don't see any and they've been promoting all week and they haven't got one sale. I mean, that can destroy an author, especially mm -hmm. uh, new authors. Um, Absolutely. It's uh, well, certainly. Go ahead. So I I'm a huge introvert, right? So which means I get sick of hearing my own voice and then anything I say, I'll have to replay for like 20 times, you know, for the next 20 years, right? And if I misspoke, I will just be horrified. Um, most of us, life, life of introverts, right? So marketing is the hardest thing because, you know, after a little bit of saying, I'm the best, look how great this is. You gotta buy it, it's five stars. Gonna change your world, gonna scare the dickens out of you. And then you're like, oh my gosh. I have to be quiet now. And then I have to recharge. It's, it's very difficult. So, so for extroverts that, that, you know, maybe it doesn't drain them as much. I, I, I need like an extrovert twin to have next to me to help me. I haven't <laughs> found that person yet. Uh, you know, so calling all extroverts, you know, PR person, uh, you, you guys go, go find yourself an introvert and adopt them. That'd be great. That how it works, is it? Well, with, with author assist, I help market and promote um, independent authors, especially those that first of all don't know what they're doing. They've just published a book and they've got no idea what to do next. That's when I come in because I don't just take over and just get on with it and they can go off and do what they're doing. I actually could do one-on-one -on -one teaching with them so that 
they know what they're doing, they're confident, they're competent. So the next book they write, they can do it themselves without having to hire anyone else. And for me, that's really important is to give back what I've learned because come 27 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing when it came to, to try and get sales for my book. Like I said, there was no eBooks. It was all paperback and there was no social media at the time either. Um, so uh, wow. yeah, that was a totally different uh, ball game that was. Um, but then I have my clients that are award-winning best-selling authors that are just writing constantly and don't have time to promote any of their books that they come to me so I can do that for them. Um, but the, with what you've got to do now being it is a virtual world and a lot of authors can't do is put themselves out there like what you're doing now with me on this uh, podcast and uh, YouTube show. Um, people will be listening and they'll be watching. Um, a lot of people can't do that and have never done that and are scared to do that, are scared to put themselves out there. But that is unfortunately the way, the only way to do it at the moment, radio, podcasts, um, Zoom meetings, you know, it's, it's the only way of, of people seeing who you are and knowing about you and your books. And uh, uh, if you're one of those people that does live in themselves, it must be very hard to uh, to come out and, and, and suddenly, here I am, you know, world, here I am. So, I mean, how difficult was it for you when you knew that you had to go out and and start being an author. <laughs> it was, well, luckily um, being a professor, you know, I, I teach, I talk for a living and and that has taught me this lifelong ability to, to make myself get out of my comfort zone um, way back, you know, starting, you know, you know competing and, and getting up on the stage and playing piano when I would just rather be in a hole uh, you know, reading a book. I, I don't want to yeah. do that. So you got to, you just got to put yourself in those situations and then realize everyone's rooting for you generally, right? Yeah. There's going to be some naysayers and there's going to be some hecklers that just are unhappy with the whole world. And they liked it that way. Yeah. Trolls. So, you know, so, so that's fine, but everyone's generally rooting for you and they're, they're interested. They want to say, you know, go get them. And, and or at least that's, you know, maybe I live in a really weird, wonderful world. I mean, that's kind of what I see. And, yes. and, and you just got to put yourself out there. And in animation, for instance, I mean, we have to show our work early and often and have the next supervising animator look at it and destroy it basically to say what we did wrong. But we have to catch those errors early because if they go on, it, 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 everything builds on it and you have to start everything over again. So, yeah. so one, it just becomes part of the artist's life. One brick goes down and the whole wall falls down with that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do you for what do you prefer? I mean, what what's easier for you, animation or writing? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. Um, well, I guess when I'm done animating, I write. So writing probably actually is the first thing because it's the thing that I, I go to all the time. Um, uh, but I, I, I animate for work and, and more I'm on the technical side of things like making 3D mm. models and making them move. Um, oh my God, I'd love to see my monsters come alive like that. How does oh. that work? Oh, it's so much fun. Uh, the class I just, I'm teaching, I'll teach this afternoon. Um, we, we did, I'm looking to see her, my, maquette, my maquettes are way back there. Um, we went through and, and designed characters and then we modeled them in clay and now we're in the computer the computer modeling them in 3d and sculpting them there oh, wow. and i don't teach the class that makes them move um to this quarter someone else has it uh, but also teach that so then we put like the bones and muscles in them and then you move oh, them wow. and it just it takes forever but then when they come alive and you have fun with it like it's, that's what it's all about oh that sounds awesome yeah i could just imagine seeing the bus stack which is just a floating mass of jellied flesh with one eye in the middle I would love to see that. They <laughs> didn't come alive. Yes. <laughs> okay, Tina, where can people find you on social media and where can they find your wonderful books? 
I am everywhere out there as T O Haley, to Haley. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Darkness no Novels, or wait, no, Darkness. You know, it's my books, and I should know the name of it. And I forget every time somebody asks me this um, Darkness Universe Novels. There it is. Um, on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Nobles, uh, you know, BookBub, the whole thing. You're right. My, my my blog and actually I have to pull it up to look at it so I have to say it correctly it's been around forever but it's coffee diem dot wordpress to all of those um but I keep everything about my writing out there and uh it's I'm pretty easy to find twitter too you want, you have a newsletter as well I don't I don't I, I occasionally uh post the things I know right I know sorry so, so much to do list um, that's a hard one to start. I would love tips on that. We're gonna we're gonna um, talk how, about that after. <laughs> I'm okay. gonna give you a yeah, right I, I, I need to understand how to start it, because uh, because you know what do I know? Um, <laughs> but obviously, I probably know because I've I've run the path and and I can remember what it was like when I didn't know how to take that first step, and the, the things I've learned. It's, uh, thank you so much for being a guest on Behind the Pen. It's been such a pleasure and uh, an enjoyment chatting with you, Tina. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Oh my gosh, I feel like we could just talk all day. Yeah, why not? Let's carry on. <laughs>